Welcome to the basics of managing school records. What follows is our essential guidance, the core of every records management training we offer, with the addition of records management considerations unique to K-12 schools. This training is for school representatives who create or receive records. We can't address every records management question or challenge in the next 40 or so minutes, but we'll provide the foundational knowledge to get you started and we'll point you towards the resources that will move you forward. First, we'll define and outline the basics of records management. Then, we'll introduce you to our records retention schedules and show you how to use them. And we'll end the presentation by addressing records unique to schools. Records management is all about control. It allows you and I to be compliant, efficient, and transparent at every stage of a record's life cycle. The life cycle of a record begins when it is created or received. This is the perfect time to make sure that everyone understands their records management responsibilities, that there are documented policies and procedures in place to guide the active management of those records, and that all agency staff is trained to use those resources to manage their records. Getting ahead in the first step of a record's life cycle guarantees straightforward retrieval, disclosure, and disposition down the line. A record is active when it's supporting your current work in the use stage. You might share active records over email or edit them as a team in a share drive. For those records to be useful to your agency, they need to be organized for accessibility. A records inventory is an excellent tool to identify what already exists, where it's stored, and how long it needs to be kept. While in the use stage, you'll want to explore adopting tools to simplify the organization of and access to your records. After you are done using a record, it moves into storage. This may be the stage at which records are the most inactive, but that isn't an excuse to sleep on a records management. This is the meat and potatoes of our work because this is where retention comes in. Understanding retention requirements, retaining records in the appropriate format for the approved amount of time, and protecting essential records are all necessary to fulfill your obligations to your agency and the public. The last stage in a record's life cycle is destruction or preservation. The best part of destroying non-archival records and transferring archival records is that your agency is no longer responsible for that material. At that point, you can point them to the DAN that gives you the authority to destroy or transfer those records. The measurable decrease in records volume will increase your job satisfaction. When you can find what you want, when you need it, you can focus on the parts of your job that bring you joy and keep you curious. Records management is an essential function of any government agency and will make your work and your life easier. First, it enables your agency to fulfill its mission. Information is one of your agency's most valuable assets, and managing your records helps you find the records that you need when you need them. When your agency has access to the right information, it can make the best possible decisions. Second, it's a lot more cost effective. If an agency is keeping only what it needs to keep and only for the necessary amount of time, there's less to hold on to, there's less material to wade through to find what you need, and there will be fewer records to keep track of. You'll save on storage costs and staff time, leaving more time and space for you to focus on yourself and the service you provide to your community. Managing records promotes open and accountable government by documenting your public service. When your agency can respond to records requests quickly and completely, they are demonstrating their compliance with state and federal law. Ultimately, Records management protects you and your agency from unnecessary risk. Public records are valuable informational assets that need your care and consideration. Records management offers the framework to provide that care, and the Washington State Archives is here to help. 
The Revised Code of Washington, or RCW, is the legal framework that governs the work we do as employees of state and local government agencies. Chapter 4014 of the RCW tells you how to manage, destroy, or transfer public records. It also provides a straightforward definition of a public record. According to the RCW, public records are anything made or received in the transaction of public business. Remember that public records aren't just text documents. They can be audio recordings, social media posts, PowerPoint slide decks, emails, and even chat logs. Anything that you create or share in the course of your job is a public record regardless of format. For instance, as a consultant, I provide advice over email. Every day, I work to file and organize those emails for retention. If you're an administrator in a police department, you could be working with case files in a database. If you are a social media coordinator, your records can take the form of tweets or status updates or Instagram posts. All this content, regardless of format, needs to be managed. Please note, the definition I've offered for a public record is for retention and destruction purposes, which is what the Washington State Archives is here to help you with. Public records are also defined under the scope of public disclosure, under Chapter 4256 of the RCW. The State Attorney General's Office can help you with the Disclosure and the Public Records Act. I'll need to invoke the Revised Code of Washington again, and this time to make the point that public records are public property. Public records belong to the general public not to the individual office holders, employees, or volunteers that create and receive them. If anything, this fact adds to the gravity of our work. Records you create at work and greater service to the public cannot go home with you or be given away. They are protected by laws in the RCW and guidance from the state and local records committee. When you take care of your records, you are taking care of public assets. So far, I've addressed the legal definition of a public record for retention and destruction purposes. But the RCW also outlines the consequences of the mismanagement of public records. Let me emphasize that it's purposeful or deliberate misconduct that this penal provision addresses. For example, in 2012, there was an investigation into controversial business practices in Skamania County. The county auditor had ordered staff to destroy records without applying retention. That former Skamania County auditor pled guilty to attempted injury to public record. They ended up performing 168 hours of community service and paid $62,000 in restitution. This doesn't mean that the police are going to come knocking on your door if you accidentally delete an email. And you don't have to hold on to everything either. But the serious consequences of deliberate records mismanagement are worth being mindful of. Aside from public records being public property, it's important to note that public records aren't specific to any one format or device. It doesn't matter if you're using an agency account or device or a personal account or device. It's the information and evidence of your work that matters. If a record you create or receive in any format or on any device relates to public business, then it's a public record. With so many ways to communicate, it's important to develop policies and procedures that address the capture, access, retrieval, and retention requirements for records generated or received on platforms like Zoom, Facebook, or Teams chat. And if you don't want to be responsible for managing public records on your personal accounts or devices, don't use them for work. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, a record's digital or physical format is not going to determine whether it's a public record, but it can determine how to retain the records. The Washington Administrative Code, or WAC, establishes that electronic records must be retained in electronic format. 
What this means is that printing and retaining a copy of a born digital record will not be an acceptable substitute. If you have a website or email record, you can't print out a copy for retention purposes. There is important metadata associated with electronic records that verify the record's authenticity. Print an electronic record and you lose that metadata. Keep that in mind when it comes to emails, tweets, or text messages. You need to keep electronic records in their electronic format. So how do you know what you need to keep and how long you need to keep it? The answer to that question lies in the records retention schedules. They specify how long to keep specific types of records. They also give agencies the authority to destroy or transfer records that have met retention. Records retention schedules are legal documents created and approved for your use by the state or local records committees. The committee members apply their expertise to address legal, historical, financial, and audit requirements. To determine retention lengths, we examine the agency's business needs, laws and professional standards, statutes of limitation or the amount of time legal action can be taken after an event has occurred. For example, you have three years to report and litigate a personal injury, so records documenting that injury are retained for at least three years. And you have six years to report and litigate a breach of contract, so records documenting that contract are retained for at least six years and you have 10 years to recover real property. So records documenting ownership of that property are retained for at least 10 years. We also consider historical significance or compliance value. And finally, we look at audit examination periods when considering retention lengths. If you work for a state agency, you'll use the state retention schedules. And if you work for a local agency, you'll use the local retention schedules. I'm going to take a break from the presentation here and walk you through our website. I want to give you a sense of where you'll find your approved records retention schedules. The first thing we'll want to do is navigate to our main page sos.wa.gov slash archives. The easiest way to access the retention schedules is via the top navigation bar. If you're with a local government agency, you're going to select the local government's link. From here, you'll want to select your type of agency. For this group, you'll want to select school districts. Once you've selected your type of agency, you'll be directed to your local agency landing page. Bookmark this page. It's going to be your number one retention and records management resource. The retention schedules your agency is approved to use are bolded at the top left of your landing page. The first schedule you should see, and this goes for all local government agencies, is the Local Government Common Records Retention Schedule, also known as CORE. CORE outlines the retention of records that are common to all local agencies. This includes meetings of your government bodies, contracts and agreements, facilities management, human resources, and others. Below CORE, you'll find your local government sector schedule, used for the unique records your agency generates and receives. Let's go back to our main page. If you're with a state agency, you will select the State Agencies link. Right off the bat, you'll be directed to the State Agency landing page. Bookmark this page. It's going to be your number one retention and records management resource. You'll find the State Records Retention Schedules linked at the top left of the State Agency landing page. Right at the top, you'll find the State Government General Records Retention Schedule also known as the State General Schedule. Like CORE, the State General Schedule covers records that are common to all state government agencies. The State General Schedule is used in conjunction with the approved schedules of your specific state agency. Because you work with a school, you'll use the State General Schedule 
and the public school's K through 12 schedule. A good rule of thumb. Your agency is approved to use the core or state general schedule along with your agency's specific or sector schedules. This gives you several different places to look to find the right retention. It's important to understand the differences between the two general schedules and your agency unique schedules. The core or state general schedule covers the administrative functions all agencies perform. This includes financial management, human resources, asset management, policy creation, and more. These schedules are most commonly about the agency operating on behalf of itself. Your sector or unique schedule covers functions and requirements specific to your agency. You'll want to make sure you consider your sector or unique schedule to make sure you don't miss any special requirements. These schedules are most commonly about the agency operating in service to others. As an example, if your agency needs to get a construction permit to build an agency-owned asset, those records fall under the general schedules. If your agency approves or issues construction permits to external agencies, those records fall under an agency unique schedule. Aside from retention schedules, you can access resources and guidance specific to your agency from your landing page. We offer countless advice sheets and guidance that can help any agency representative manage their records. This is a screenshot of one record series, meetings, staff, and internal committees that you'll find in both the core and the state general schedule. Retention schedules are lists of record types and agency manages, much like any list you create or use in your work. Each type of record has a disposition authority number, or DAN. DANs are unique identifiers that authorize the retention and disposition of a record. Like most unique alphanumeric identifiers, DANs don't make much sense on their own. But in the context of an entire schedule, they distinguish one series from another. DANs are important to include in inventories, box content lists, or disposition logs. The description of records field is where you can expect to spend most of your time. It describes the business function and type of record that falls under that DAN. It includes descriptions and examples of records included and excluded in that business process. This can seem confusing at first, but knowing what types of records are included as well as excluded will help you identify the correct record series. Keep in mind, your record may still fall under that DAN if it matches the description but isn't specifically identified in the included list. This happens a lot because different agencies call the same document or file by a different name. Thankfully, Record series are functional and not subject or department dependent to include as many applicable records as possible. This record series covers records about the agency operating on behalf of itself, placing it in the realm of core and the state general schedule. The retention and disposition action tells you how long to retain a record, when that countdown starts, and what you do with a record once it has met retention. In this example, you have two countdown triggers, end of calendar year and until no longer needed for agency business. As soon as both is satisfied, the record is retained for two years before being destroyed. The designation field can go in one of several ways, starting with archival or non-archival. Archival records have long-term public research value and should be transferred to the Washington State Archives for appraisal or permanent retention. Non-archival records don't carry the same weight and can be destroyed as soon as they've met retention. Another designation category is essential or non-essential. Essential records need to be protected and or backed up to resume business under emergency conditions. Non-essential records do not need the same care or consideration. The final designation, which is either OPR or OFM, 
has no bearing on your work, so you won't need to consider this holdover from some dated legislation. Many of our state and local government agencies are caught in between paper and digital processes. As your office goes digital, it's important to consider how you'll manage the paper backlog. If the records are designated archival, you have several options, and each of them relieves you of your legal responsibility to care for those records. You can transfer archival paper or digital records to the Washington State Archives at the end of the retention period. Have archival paper originals and digital scans of the material? Offer it all up to the archives. You should hold on to the scans until they've met retention, but we can take the paper originals early. Please note, you will be responsible for responding to public records requests for any archival records you hold on to. Make your life easier by making your archival records our responsibility. If the records are designated non-archival, you'll have to think about what should be retained and or digitized and what can be defensively destroyed. Consider scanning non-archival records with extensive retention requirements to save space and increase access. Organize and store physical non-archival records with retention requirements shorter than six years. Non-archival records that are frequently access, accessed are good candidates for scanning, especially if they are a challenge to access in their paper form. Please note, be selective about the records you digitize. Going digital makes access easier but it can also turn a paper problem into an electronic one. Organization and planning are key no matter what format you choose to retain your records in. This is the main thing we want you to understand about retention. Your responsibility is to keep your agency's records for the minimum amount of time listed in the retention schedule, and then either destroy them or transfer them to the state archives for preservation or appraisal. Please keep in mind that there are only two agencies authorized to be legal custodians of your records. That's your agency or the Washington State Archives. You can't transfer records to an individual, a library, a historical society, or anything like that. And you can't allow staff to keep records as personal possessions. Agencies can choose to hold on to records past retention for a variety of different reasons, but there are a couple of situations where you would absolutely need to hang on to your records past their minimum retention. One is in the case of a litigation hold. If there's a lawsuit pending or ongoing and you have records that are responsive to that litigation, you would need to keep those records until the litigation has been resolved or the hold is lifted. The second situation is if there's a public records request. Let's say you've got records that are 20 years past their retention. You've already identified them as non-archival and you plan to destroy the records next Monday. If a public records request comes in this afternoon for those records slated for destruction, you'll still need to provide them to fulfill the public records request because they are still in your possession. Once the request is fulfilled, you can resume with destruction or transfer as planned. So what can you destroy now? Transitory records have temporary informational value and should be deleted or recycled as soon as possible. You'll find a whole section of record series at the end of both the core and state general schedule that will help you connect your transitory records to the appropriate DANs for disposal. Thankfully, a significant percentage of the public records we create and receive are transitory. Your best defense against transitory records is to dispose of these records as soon as you've identified the DAN that gives you the legal authority to do so. By getting rid of what you can when you can, you'll make records management so much easier on yourself. For as many times as you create and receive a record, you are going to face a retention decision. Some of those decisions are easy, such as identifying and destroying a transitory record. 
but many of these retention decisions will take some time and careful consideration. Only regular and consistent experience with your approved retention schedules is going to make it easier. This is going to be a challenge at first, like any new process you take on. It's important to understand that while you have hundreds of retention series options, the specific nature of your work will narrow down those options to something closer to a dozen. The first thing you want to do when faced with any retention determination is to ask some questions. Determining whether the record is unique to your agency will guide you to your general or agency-specific schedule. Understanding how a record is processed and who is involved will reinforce which schedule to use and land you in the correct functional category. Understanding the context of a record is going to reinforce that functional category. And knowing what the record is about will help you narrow in on the appropriate record series. Once you've addressed these foundational questions, visit your approved retention schedules on our website. Using the three main navigation techniques, find the record series that works best for the record at hand. If you still aren't clear on the appropriate retention series, reach out to the records management team at the Washington State Archives. We are here to help. For our first example, let's consider student permission slips. Because student permission slips are unique to schools, their retention is found in the public school's K-12 records retention schedule. There are a multitude of situations where permission is necessary when it comes to minors. The questions we pose in this slide are going to help you narrow down your options as you navigate through the schedule. Looking at the table of contents, you'll find student administration and student services. You can expect to find the permission DANs in these two sections. Control F the school schedule to run a search on the keyword permission. Browse the subject index at the back of the schedule with the same keyword in mind. These strategies are going to get you close to the right record series, but posing the questions we offer here will help you pinpoint exactly where you need to be. Choose the record series that is the most appropriate and reach out if you need some guidance. There are two files maintained for each student, and it's important to distinguish between the two. The official student record, which is retained for 100 years after the student graduates or leaves the district, and the student cumulative file, which is retained for three years after the student graduates or leaves the district. 100 years is a very long time but the official student record only includes a standardized high school transcript, middle school or junior high grade history, elementary grade progression or enrollment history, year-end report cards, if these are the district's evidence of elementary grade progression, and records documenting all successful requests for changes to the official student record. The official student record captures the official grade progression of a student. The student cumulative file is for everything else. This includes entry withdrawal dates, legal identifying documents, records of student accomplishments and participation in school activities, grade progressions and retention notifications when not covered by the official student record, standardized testing reports, student photographs, and registration forms. Let's outline some strategies for retaining your official student records. Retaining anything for 100 years is going to cost money, so make sure you are only keeping what is necessary. If you store paper records in a clean, dry space, they'll last for hundreds of years. Microfilm won't need reformatting and can be stored with the Washington State Archives, but it will limit access. TIFF or PDFA digital file formats are easier to search and access, but will require digital storage space and can be migrated over time. Official student records should be filed separately from the student cumulative file, so you don't have to keep everything for 100 years. 
Another common question we receive is what to do when a student moves to a new district. The new district needs access to the information in the student's records, but the old district still needs the original records as evidence of their actions. The old district is required to send the new district a copy of the student's cumulative file and official student record and retain the originals. Each district handles the original record of their own activities. This means that the district that created the, the file is responsible for the original copy until it has met retention, even if the student has transferred to a new district. The main question we field about special education records is how long to keep SPED files and notices. SPED program records are unique to schools, so you'll locate the retention in the public school schedule. State and federal code require schools to notify parents or adult children when a student's SPED records are no longer necessary. Since the records and notices have a six-year retention, the most efficient approach is to send the notice immediately after the student leaves the special education program. Then, put your record of the notice in the student's file and keep them together. This way, you don't have to track the retention of each record, and you don't have to track down students six years after they've left the school. You don't need to send a letter to each home, either. Consider sending postcards instead of letters, or post a notice on your website, in your newsletter, newsletter or place an ad in the local, local newspaper. You want to make sure you've given proper notice and are clear that the school intends to destroy the records. Check with your legal counsel to make sure you're meeting legal requirements. For detailed information on notification requirements, contact your FERPA officer or OSPI. Student emails are another topic we're regularly asked about. For the most part, schools are not responsible for managing student email even though they provide the accounts. Student emails aren't public records because they're not conducting business on behalf of the district. Because their emails aren't public records, they don't need to be retained. For instance, if students email staff or faculty, the staff or faculty member's email is a public record subject to retention requirements. The student's email is not. There is an important exception. If students are conducting business on behalf of the district, whether fundraising or participating in associated student body activities, their emails are considered public records subject to retention requirements. We rely on you to help us identify what record series to highlight or whether the language in those series becomes dated or obsolete. We do everything we can to stay on top of retention series updates, but we're juggling the retention schedules for all state and local government agencies. We need your help. You are our subject matter experts and retention schedules are living documents that are regularly revisited and revised. If you don't find what you're looking for on our website, or you're not even sure what you should be looking for, we're here to provide advice and consultation by phone or email. It's the best part of our jobs to connect with all of the diverse state and local government agency representatives, so don't be shy with your questions or concerns. All our services are free, and there is no record too small or project too big to reach out and ask for help. It's what we're here for. Thank you for your time.